Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard, and today we're doing a video that I've really wanted to do for a while because it covers one of my absolute favorite features of Akka.net, behavior switching. Behavior switching is how actors can change the way they process messages dynamically at runtime, and it allows us to really simplify what would otherwise be a fairly complex operation into just being some internal details inside an actor. So things like state machines for representing all the different states an IoT device can be in, or handling a really long running workflow, or handling a complex saga, things like that are all things that switchable behaviors make it really easy for us to model in a fairly small amount of code. So I'm not gonna recap everything that goes into how Akadana actors work. We've got some other videos that kind of cover it. You should probably start with looking at how actors process messages since that's an important detail. But the things we're gonna focus on today are the state and behavior facets of an actor. So an actor is really composed of these three elements, state, behavior, and location. Location really refers to things like distributed systems of actors. So where is an actor on the actor hierarchy and which process is it inside of? If you wanna learn more about that, check out some of our videos on Akadot Cluster. But for now, we're gonna focus on state and behavior. Every actor must have a default messaging behavior. In the untyped actor base class, it's the on receive method, which is an abstract method that you have to implement in order for this actor type to compile. So here we just have our on receive method. We have a switch statement. We're gonna do different things depending on what the type and the content of the message is. This is our default message processing behavior. Other actor types like this actor code we're looking at here, and we'll see the full code sample for this in a minute. This actor is going to receive a check package command. And what we're gonna do is we're going to tell this other actor right here, we're gonna tell this other actor to fetch this change feed state. So that's a piece of data this actor is gonna need. And while we're waiting for that actor to do its job, we're gonna shift our behavior using the become method to this fetching package state behavior instead. So we're gonna stop using this method to process messages and use this one instead. That's the basics of actor behavior switching right there. Now inside this new behavior, what are we doing? Well, we're returning a receive delegate in this case. Most developers when they're working with Akka.net don't bother doing this. They'll just use a Lambda expression instead. A receive delegate is just an action that accepts a object as an argument. It's about as universal of a delegate as you can possibly get in .NET. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to wait for that actor we previously messaged to send us a change feed state query response. This basically has all of the data on a NuGet package that we're trying to scan. This is for, this code is for a, a product we haven't even announced yet, but basically we're doing supply chain verification on NuGet packages. So there's two different types of queries you can run, a fast and a slow query. The fast query uses like a hundred times less IO than the slow query does. Uh, but there's certain types of problems that only the slow query can detect. Uh, so we have to run a little bit of both. We don't want to run a slow query each time because it's much more resource intensive. That's the basics of what this actor is trying to do in this method. But you'll notice, based off of the state that we have here, the type of command we're going to run, I can switch behavior to a fast scan or a slow scan. And these scans do different things depending on with the state that we're passing in from this actor and based off the command type as well. This is basically how we do behavior switching. It's really, really simple from a syntactical standpoint. The become method is what powers all of this. The become method tells the actor to forget all of your old message processing handlers and only use this new one going forward. So become is a replacement operation, not an addition operation. So we're going to forget all the old handlers and only use the new ones going forward. This applies to all messages the actor is going to process immediately after the become call. So the next message in the actor's mailbox that's waiting to be processed will be processed using this new behavior. Stashing is frequently used in combination with behavior switching. We're probably going to do a separate video on stashing in the future, but stashing is a way of buffering messages that we can't process right now. So if we're building a finite state machine and I'm waiting for a critical piece of data to arrive before I begin doing my work, other less important pieces of data or maybe some additional commands I can't process right now, all of those might get stashed while I'm waiting to complete the most important thing this actor needs to do at any given time. So stashing is a really useful tool for being able to defer processing of messages when you're not ready to process them right now. And then finally, the last thing I'll mention about behavior switching 
is that actors will always reboot to their initial behavior following a restart. So you can watch our video on how actors restart here, but by default, whatever your default behavior is that's specified in your constructor, that actor is going to start in that behavior every time it reboots. Now, if you use Akadot Persistence or tools like that, you can potentially specify after you're done recovering what behavior you want to start in. That's something you can customize using Akadot Persistence, for instance. But by default, with normal in-memory actors, they always reboot to their initial behavior. So this is the actor I've been showing some source code from on our slides so far. This is part of a product that we haven't announced yet. And what it's basically doing is supply chain security analysis on NuGet packages. So this actor implements the I with stash interface. This is how we do stashing. We're gonna buffer messages that we can't process right now uh, while we're waiting for other pieces of data we might need. So that's what the stash is gonna be used for. And let's scroll down to the constructor real quick. We begin in this on receive state right here. And when we receive a request to check a package, the first thing we need to get back is we actually need to know what the current state of this package is as far as our system knows. What's the last observed state we have for this package? So we're gonna request that data from the change feed actor. And then we're going to shift behaviors to this fetching package state right here. And we're gonna pass in the original command that was sent to us as an input down to this method. This method is going to return a receive delegate. This is basically just kind of like a, a closure, more or less is how, how this is working. So we're passing in this data and then we're constructing this little, you know, it's basically an action that takes an object as input. That's what a receive delegate is. I don't wanna to get too deep into the weeds and how this actor works, but the long and the short of it is we have two different scan types, a fast scan and a slow scan. Uh, the fast scan basically is something that we run pretty frequently because it's cheap and it can find most of the severe issues. The slow scan requires us to go and compare like a hundred times more data than the previous one does. So we run that much less frequently in order to make sure that we're not straining the system. That's why we do that. So we are going to change our behavior again, depending upon what type of scan was requested in this check package call up here. Now, one thing I want to note is that we're using stashing down below. So there are some cases where we might be asked to perform both a slow and a fast scan. We do not want to run both of those at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to encapsulate that complexity by using a bit of stashing and behavior switching. The stash basically acts as a buffer of requests that we don't want to process right now. So I'm going to go ahead and append this message to the back of our stash by calling stash.stash. .stash. That'll preserve the current message and who sent it. At some point in the future, when we're done performing one of these scans, I'm going to unstash that message, and that message will get prepended to the front of the actor's mailbox. We'll do a whole nother video on stashing that kind of covers that a little bit more detail, but that's the gist of what this is doing here. It's allowing us to say, not right now, we've got other more important things to do. So if we dive into like our fast scan behavior, for instance, I'm gonna do things like when I receive the check, I'm gonna start a timer. I'm gonna go and kick off this async task right here. That's gonna cause us to fetch all the ownership data. And then when we get that ownership data back, we're gonna process it. And then we're gonna kick off another stage where we're gonna get some information about the newest versions of that package. And we're gonna compare it to the most recent ones we have. And then finally, at the very end, once that query is complete, we're gonna go ahead and reset our behavior, which is going to involve unstashing, any additional requests we may have received, canceling any pending timers that were part of this current query, and shifting back to our original behavior. We're gonna reset so we can do everything all over again from scratch. This basically allows us to model what would otherwise be a pretty complex state machine, allows us to model it as a couple of behaviors with a little bit of message buffering and with just some message handling. This is far simpler than what the same thing would be using async await. And the other thing that helps make it simple is that I can still query and ping this actor while it's in the middle of doing this long running job. I'm not blocking on stuff, essentially. It's all kind of running behind the scenes and doing a little bit of background IO processing, which is really nice. So that means that if I needed to get progress reports back on a super long running job, this design would let me do that if I needed to. So I wanna close out this video by talking real quickly about the use cases for switchable behavior. The first is powerful stateful programming. Basically what switchable behavior lets you do is it kind of supports your state in determining how you do your work inside the application. 
This is really unfamiliar territory for a lot of folks who, you know, probably have spent most of their careers building like ASP.NET applications where everything is inherently stateless. In a stateful paradigm, you have the ability to react to changes as they're happening in real time. And part of that reaction could be changing what you do with new information you receive going forward. This lets you build things like finite state machines and sagas where each state can basically have its own behavior. So for instance, with that actor we just took a look at, I have, might have one state where I'm waiting for the input I need to begin a job, and I might have another state where that job is actually running, and I have different execution steps depending upon what type of job I need to do. Stateful programming and behavior switching make that very easy to do. These are things you can accomplish with a fairly small amount of Akka.NET actor code. Long-running jobs are another really great use case for switchable behavior. One thing you never want to do in Akka.NET or in any other programming paradigm for that matter is block on a long-running operation. That is going to be a recipe for tears. What you want to do instead is maybe kick off a long-running job either as a sequence of messaging interactions, which is what we did, or you could kick it off as one long-running task, and then you maybe you hang on to something like a cancellation token. If you need to cancel a job midway through, the actor can just receive a message and you can invoke the cancellation token. No problem. Whereas if you're awaiting on that long running job, you have no ability to go ahead and interrupt the actor because it's waiting for that operation to complete. So using a switchable behavior instead is a much more powerful way of doing that. Plus you can even do things like issue progress reports as the job is running. That's something that switchable behavior will let you do quite easily. The biggest reason for using switchable behavior though is it allows you to take a complex domain problem and atomize it to becoming just the internal behavior of a single actor type. So for instance, when we're doing IoT and other things like that, we might be modeling a device that has five or six different states. Each one of those can basically be just an internal behavior of the actor we're building to act as a digital twin for that device. So rather than exposing all this complexity on the outside through having different actor types and different message routing and different types of messages that need to be sent, that can all be encapsulated inside the implementation class of a single actor type. That makes Alka.net really powerful for being able to model things that are inherently complicated. And it hides that complexity from anybody else who needs to be able to interact with those objects. So switchable behavior really is an underrated superpower of Akka.net. I hope everyone tries out Akka.net Bootcamp and uh, gives, gives that a shot and uh, where you'll get exposed a little bit of behavior switching there. I think you'll really get a lot of benefit out of it. But otherwise, thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos on how to do sophisticated things with .NET. Thank you very much.